have shit.
Hi, Lisa. It's Carol Sofer. Uh, I'm okay. So I've, I'm the host of this Zoom, and I'm okay. in the room. Uh, could you try to uh, join the, the meeting? Okay, no problem. I need... Sure, sure. No urgency. Okay, no problem. I'm going to ask someone else to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 I get it. Yeah, no rushes. No rush, Lisa, really. Okay, bye. Thank you very much for your please leave your message after the tone. Hi Louise, just calling to see if you're joining um the Lisa Bar Zoom tonight. And I need someone to make sure that I'm doing the hosting right. Uh but I guess you're not available. Uh thank you. It's Carol. Bye. Hi. Uh, can you do me a huge favor? I'm hosting the Zoom with Lisa Barr tonight, and I've never done it before. And I opened the room, and it says that I'm the host, but I don't know how to let somebody in. Yeah, oh, I'm on the laptop, yes. Could you could you do me a huge favor and 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 try it and see if I can figure out how to do it? Um, because it's it's early now and I've opened the room and it's already recording me and all I see is myself. Yeah, we can talk. I called Louise. Of course, she doesn't answer. Um, and I called the speaker, and she's too busy. It's seven o'clock. No, it's always seven. No, it's seven. It says sisterhood, PJTC sisterhood. I mean, I called the speaker, but she's busy. She's got to finish up a bunch of stuff. She's too busy to try it. Okay, good. Oh, yeah, there you are. So I see your name. And there you are. How cute you look. You look adorable, Diane. Seven thirty tomorrow. Yeah, I've just been so I'm zoomed out already, but <laughs> I bet. Oh yeah, I will. I will. I will. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've been looking at other synagogue websites for another reason, and you know, they all have inclusiveness in their mission statement. 
which is really nice. Uh, Ramazion, I looked at Ramazion. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. Oh, wow, okay. Um, I'm hearing you from my phone. Um, so I don't know how to unmute. I can, I can, I don't know how to unmute you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm muting my phone and I'll see if I can hear you through the computer. Okay, I don't hear you through the computer. Yeah, I'm hearing, I'm turning, yeah, I hear you from the phone. Yeah, I can't hear you, no. I can un, hold on. But I hear you through the phone. So I see a little microphone next to your name. Sound clear. She tried to See. So where it says participants, I hear you through the phone now. Okay, I unmuted my phone. Um, I have your. Let me unmute you. And it says ask to unmute. I hear you through the phone. Let, let, no, this is hard. Okay. Okay. No. Wait. See, all I'm, I'm, I'm on the bottom, it says mute all. It says, it says mute all on the bottom of my screen on the right side under participants. Yeah. Yeah, well, that part I know. I'm trying to unmute you. Yeah, it says allow participants to unmute themselves. Allow participants to... Re okay. Well, that's got a check mark next to it. No, now you're now the microphone has a cross off on your name. Yeah. Yeah, but I hear you through the phone.
Now I lost her. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Hi. I'm trying to figure out how to unmute you. Can you hear me? Now I can. Yes. All right. Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi. Wait, hold how on. For some reason, you sound really. Can you hear me now? Yes. There. Okay. There's the volume. Um, my friend Michael is is my tech support right now. Okay. He's coming on. Um. I'm trying to unmute him and I'm tr I don't know how to do it uh, in the corner. Can you unmute him on the maybe he can unmute himself in the corner of his uh, to the to the left hand side at the bottom He says he can't hear. I'm going to call him. Okay, let me try. Mute all. Yes, to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Lisa, yeah. you can yeah, hear can me. Hear okay. Um, and he's still asked to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, you did something and I got a message saying that, that you unmuted me, click here. So I couldn't do it before, but I did it now. Michael, this is Lisa Barr Hi, Lisa. speaking tonight, so Michael is, Burke. Lisa, nice it sounds you. like you've done this before. I've never hosted a meeting, so yeah. as a host, I mean. So I'm not much help. No so worries. As soon as what I had to do, as soon as as soon as you came on, the little I had to click on the little microphone under your picture. But I shouldn't have to do that for every single participant, should I? That doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Okay. I'm gonna, I tried calling Louise who usually hosts and she didn't answer. Uh, and we are being recorded by the way. But you look lovely, very nice. Are you talking to me? Yes. Oh, oh okay. No, I'm not, I don't think I'd okay. say that to Michael. Yeah, you should know. I'm in my sweatpants, it's nine o'clock here. <laughs> yeah, but this, the shirt is nice. And this is you. Diane. Hello. Hi, hi. So hi. you're you're good, Diane. You're not muted. Excellent. All right. So you know how to unmute now, Carol, and mute? Well, I didn't have to do it for you. That's good. But you so, don't, but you want to mute people while your speakers well, talking. Well, I see the mute all uh uh sign on the bottom. Okay. And and Teresa taught me how to do that, but she didn't okay. give me complete, you know, she gave me what she thought were complete yeah, instructions. Okay. okay I'm going to drop Lisa, off, Carol. Time. I'm going to drop off, okay? Okay, thank you, Michael. Sure. I appreciate it. I owe you. No, oh, I didn't <laughs> do much. Didn't do much. Yeah, I owe you. Oh, so, okay. Um, thank you. So okay. I, 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 can you see the book behind me? <laughs> Not too well, really. Oh, no. Can yeah. You, can you move it up? 
I can't unless I mount it on something. So I'd right have to, to put next to the. But see what happens if you put put it right up next to the screen, Carol. Yeah. I okay. Can hold me, it up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You could do that. Yeah. Do that. I and mean, I can not hold it up, but she has it behind her. She has all her books you on her bookcase. You can't see it that well behind her. Let me see if I can get this bigger. My screen. Yeah. Bigger. Oh, that's not working like I thought it would. Huh. I was hoping Mike, I, I can't get the screen bigger. Could you help me see what's going on with? Oh, wait a minute. I think I can. Hold on. Oh, There's a little, there should be a little arrow. There it is. I got it. I got it. Yeah. It just wasn't working. I have a new laptop. And oh. so I'm I'm just tripping. I know. I know. It's hard to get used to them. Well, it's not so much that. I was always using an iPad. So I'm using oh, yeah. it a different way, you know. I'm I'm doing the motions. That the laptop I... that I have is um, fun functions as a i as a tablet iPad also. Really, it's touch screen and uh, oh, that's nice. A laptop, yeah, yeah. Evan Evan recommended it, but it wasn't you know hard to get used to. Was that an Apple? No, it's uh -huh. an HP. Oh. It's called HP Envy. Uh huh. Carol and it it works uh, like a laptop, and then it also works touch screen. Uh -huh. Carol, I think yes. I think your author was one of Hi, talk. yes. Um, just a couple questions, just sure. the format. So you're going to introduce me. Yes. I'm going to speak, and then we're going to have a Q and A. Yes, I will start the Q and A with so, uh, um, a couple I of have, prepared uh, questions. The event is in total an hour, correct? Or yes. Okay. At most, yes. At most, it could be less. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, this is actually going to be, we're not doing our usual Rosh Chodesh uh opening prayer and ending prayer, mm -hmm. uh, which is a poem. So we're not going to be doing that because it's not Rosh Chodesh. Right. Right. So it'll I'll just get right into it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to, I will have, I'm going to be using a couple of your questions that you uh, sent. Okay. Sounds great. So, um, and then they'll take it. They'll, they'll believe me, ask you a lot of questions. They're okay. very uh, smart and they're very um, engaged. Okay. I'll have to close it so. up. Hi, right, Linda. Hi, Linda. Nice to see you. You too. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa's waiting. Lisa's here. Diane is here. Everybody Diane. wait. Seven on the dot or 701. Well, <laughs> this is my first uh, hosting circumstance. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I went in early. So it started recording right away. Oh. So there's a lot of uh, stuff uh, being recorded that uh, at the beginning. Right. But I wanted to get a head start and it's a good thing because I had to learn the, the process. So like, okay, do you know here's, how to, here's Jenny Blitz. Do you know how to let her come in? Um, no. Something that shows up at the top. Yeah, I see it. And it but says it's, admit. It's not showing me that. It's just showing me iPhone Virginia Blitz. Oh, well, then it doesn't require anyone. No, to because when you came on, I didn't have to do anything. You were just okay. there. And, okay, that's a setting that they set up in advance to kind of. They, they did that. Yeah, this is PJTC that did that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. How are you, Linda? I'm in my countdown mode. We're leaving for Bhutan and Nepal next week. Oh, my goodness. Wow. What? Linda? Sorry about that. Yeah. Well, um, you know, Carol, why don't you click where it says Ginny's phone, iPhone V Blitz, and see what happens. Maybe that would let. So, giving me an option, it says mute on the top now. 
Okay, you don't have to mute her yet, but you could click on her name or on the name where it says. She just I left. She just left. What? No, it's still on. She's still on my screen. Vinny, are you there? I'm here. But your video's not showing. Uh, I didn't really feel like showing myself. But oh, okay, I got, I got it. Okay, I was confused. I'm sorry. This is okay. Thanks. I thought that was my problem. My so we're wait. We're gonna wait for more people. A lot of people think it's. Uh, Unfortunately, may think it's seven thirty. Although it did say seven on the flyer. I'm just going to change my lighting. Excuse me. I'm just, like I said. I'm trying to get used to this new computer. So we'll see how the lighting goes. Well, okay. we don't get any sense of, we don't have any sort of an R, not an RSVP, but a, don't. Hmm. Sorry, Lisa. It's, uh, I mean, I, I, okay. Yeah, I'm on the book festival and one of the ones who went to the JBs. Oh, here come more people. See? Yeah, they just, they're just slow in joining. Hi, Gail. Hi, Thanks Gail. for joining Hi. us. Hi, Denise. Hi. Thanks for joining. Hmm. We're going to start in a, in a few more minutes. Let more people come. I'm calling, making a couple calls here. Phone calls, or if you want to give me yes. some names, maybe I can text them. Uh, I was texting Nancy. Oh. Um, although she's busy with her daughter's wedding. Oh, hello. Just see iPhone. Girl, do you want me to come back in in about 15 minutes or so? I mean, uh, you could maybe 10 minutes. Because, yeah, let's see how it is. And if it's just this small group, then we can just discuss it for a little bit. Okay. And okay. I mean, a 30 minute speech. It just okay, seems that's cool. great. Okay, so um, whatever you want to do, Lisa, seven, say seven ten. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come back in a little bit. Building. Okay. Okay, for those who are just arriving, um, we're waiting for a few more minutes to get a little bit more of a critical mass. Hello. Hi, Eva. Hi, Eva. Nice to see Hi. you. Hello, Deb Hello. Debbie. Let's start my video. There we go. <laughs> Hello. Hello, iPhone person. <laughs> I forgot your name. You were at the board meeting yesterday. She doesn't hear me. No, she hears you. She doesn't know you mean her. Yeah, oh. she's, she's Hello. Hello. Muted. There Hi. you go. Hi, your name is not showing on your on your screen. Wow. Okay. 
You're a new understand. member, and I don't know that everybody knows you. Could you <laughs> introduce yourself? We're not starting yes. yet because we're waiting for more me? people. Yes, we can. Great. I'm Lori Hunt. Lori. Nice. Glad that you can join Hi, us, Lori. Lori. Hi. Where the speaker is coming back in five minutes. We're waiting for more people to join. Well, we have 13 right now. That's great. Good. Yeah. And there's Andrea. Nice to, nice to see you, Andrea. Hopefully. Anita. <laughs> Hello, Anita. We're, okay. They're coming on in. Hi, Gail. Oh, wow. Linda. Diana. Susan. This is me. Welcome, Susan. What you think comes latest batch? Oh, you turned it off. We're starting at 710. I have 706. Now 707. But welcome. Hi, Hi Anita. Hi. How are you feeling today? I have my soup to get chased away the cold. Good. I'm feeling okay. How about you? Okay. You're full um, of energy? to lead this on I have group. energy yeah this is my first time hosting one of these so please oh, bear Marvita. with me yeah <laughs> i should say it's shahianu right mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah right haksameach everyone haksameach yeah my yes. granddaughter Wait, went to uh hear the megillah tonight i uh, it's interesting that their shul is doing it tonight in Las Vegas, but that's okay. It says in the Megillah that you're supposed to observe two days of Purim. Two time, right, two days. Of, you know. <laughs> Listen to <laughs> it once at night and once in the daytime. So I was told. Okay. Our speaker will be back in a minute. Well, two minutes, actually. So welcome, all of you. How many do we have now? Oh, Diane left. 15. 15. Good, Gail. Thank you. I didn't. Now, if you want to get started, we could do the little prayer. So when she comes back on. No, this isn't Rosh Chodesh. So oh. we're not doing it. <laughs> no, no prayer tonight. Okay. Actually, I am going to turn off. I'm going to be back in one minute, less than a minute. I'm going to turn off my phone so it doesn't ring. Oh, hello. It's you. <laughs> it is, it is. Okay, so welcome, everyone. Welcome, Lisa. Nice to see so you all see the wonderful book. So I'd like to say welcome to our uh, second attempt in having Lisa Barr talk to us about her book, Woman on Fire. And I just finished it. I got to about the last 50 pages and I had to read the whole thing at once the whole last part of the book because there was so much suspense and I was hanging and I had to finish it before I went to bed. And that's what happened. It's such a great page turner. So Lisa is, I'd like to welcome Lisa Barr and welcome all of you. Lisa Barr is the New York Times bestselling author of Woman on Fire, which I just said. And The Unbreakables, another one of her books, and the historical thriller Fugitive Colors, which is a suspense, suspenseful tale of stolen art, love, lust, deception, and revenge on the eve of World War II. The novel won the Ippy Gold Medal for Best Literary Fiction of 2014. This is her other book. The first prize at the Hollywood Film Festival. Um, in addition, Lisa served as an editor for the Jerusalem Post, 
Managing Editor of Today's Chicago Woman, Managing Editor of Moment Magazine. I'm sure all of you have seen Moment Magazine, which is excellent. Right. And as an editor reporter for the Chicago Sometime, Sometimes, my favorite. <laughs> Among the highlights of her career, Lisa covered the famous handshake, which I'm sure all of you remember, between the late Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and the late PLO leader Yasser Arafat oh. and President Bill Clinton at the White House. Boy, what a nice thing. Lisa has been featured on Good Morning America and Today for her work as an author, journalist, and blogger. Uh, in breaking book news, actress Sharon Stone is set to produce and star in the film adaptation of Woman on Fire. Woo Lisa lives in, in the Chicago area with her husband and three daughters. So without any more announcements or anything, I'd like to just let Lisa take over. And I encourage all of you to purchase the book, read the book. It's terrific. And take it away, Lisa. All right. Hi, everybody. It's certainly I'm going to mute everybody. Certainly an honor to be here today. Uh, just let me know. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, good. Um, and thank you, Carol, for the introduction and for organizing this. And it's really extra lovely to be here because it's International Women's Day. Um, and yes, so lovely to be here tonight. Um, I'm just going to slip out my glasses and get to it. So I'm Lisa Barr, mm -hmm. author, mom, wife, journalist. I'm a Chicago girl, and I attended Solomon Schechter Day School growing up, if you know that school, it's a Jewish day school, which instilled a deep love of Judaism, Israel, and gave me the creative goods at a young age. My teachers nurtured my love of writing and encouraged me to always ask questions and go deeper. I graduated from the University of Illinois and got my master's at the Medill School of Journalism, Northwestern University. Chicago journalism was my boot camp. I began my career right out of college at a big arts and entertainment um, public relations agency in Chicago. And I started there as an intern. And my first client was a place that probably none of you have ever heard of called Starbucks. And so about a hundred years ago, I took then CEO Howard Schultz around to introduce this new coffee experience. Uh, I then worked for political news commentator Joel Wiseman as his researcher for two years at um, WGN TV in Chicago. Joel really taught me how to never take no for an answer. And he was definitely one of the inspirations for my crusty journalist, Dan Mansfield in Woman on Fire. I then went on to become the managing editor of Today's Chicago Woman for a couple years. And I had my own column interviewing Chicago legends like advice columnist Ann Landers. And we actually, Ann and I did the interview in her closet. And that's another story. But then at age 28, I decided I needed a real change. I had just gotten out of a long relationship and everyone was driving me crazy. Why wasn't I married? And you're on a ticking clock. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm out of here. And I went, I went, I wanted to have an adventure. So I moved to Jerusalem with just my bike, two bags, and a computer. And I became a reporter and an editor of a weekend section of the Jerusalem Post for the next five years. And it was probably the best job of my life. I covered everything from interviewing presidents and prime ministers and celebrities like Madonna, Robert De Niro, to the music and to Sting, and to covering terrorism, which was not an easy gig. In the early 90s, there was a slew of bus bombings in Jerusalem. And one of my hardest assignments was covering the hospital waiting rooms interviewing members of the community who were waiting to hear if their loved ones were dead or alive. And if you can imagine what it was like having to shove a microphone under someone's nose right at that moment. It was hard and it was devastating. And many nights after work, and especially working those assignments, I would cry myself to sleep. It was tough. 
One particular story is the game changer for me. I was on my way home from Jer Jerusalem to Chicago for a family event, and I stopped in Washington, D.C. to see my best friend. And then I got a call. Can you be at the White House tomorrow morning? It's top secret. And I'm like, hell yeah. And uh -huh. there I was, one of three reporters from the Jerusalem Post uh, covering the famous handshake between President Bill Clinton, the late Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, and P PLO leader Yasser Arafat. It was exhilarating covering that piece of history, and then we all know what happened. The peace process went south, and Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated. I remember this horrific moment like it was yesterday. Leah Rabin, his wife, known as the Jackie O of Israel, became the lioness, taking care of an entire country whose dreams of peace had been shattered, caring for an entire nation while she herself was in mourning, having had to bury her murdered husband, an Israeli hero of 47 years. Leah Rabin, Leah Rabin granted me the exclusive interview for Vogue magazine just a few weeks after the assassination. She invited me into her home in Tel Aviv. I remember going up the elevator of that apartment building on that day, and I have never been so personally terrified in my life for an interview. If you can imagine what it was like in Israel at that time, everything was so raw, so fragile. My heart was racing when Leah entered the room, hand outstretched graciously, and we sat across from each other, coffee in hand, with just enough emotional distance. But Leah Rabin was nobody's victim. During the interview, I asked her one particular question. Mrs. Rabin, I asked, is he proud of you, the way you have stepped inside his shoes, mothering an entire nation when you yourself are in such deep pain? She looked at me, the stoic woman carrying the weight of the country on her shoulders and began to cry. She cried, I cried, and we held each other. There was no journalist subject separation and we stayed in contract, contact as friends until her passing. This story for me remains to this day one of my most meaningful pieces. From Jerusalem, I moved to Washington DC and I went on to become the managing editor of Moment Magazine, which was founded by a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Ellie Wiesel. And then a few years later, I moved back to Chicago and served as an editor and reporter for the Chicago Sun-Times, where I launched the paper's first women's section called Lifestyles. And author Erica Zhang, my literary crush, was my kickoff interview. Hmm. Why am I telling you all of this, giving you a play-by-play -play of my background? Because my 24-year-old savvy young journalist from Chicago, Jules Roth, the main character in my new novel, Woman on Fire, has a lot of the younger me in her. The me of years ago, before I became old and seasoned and jaded, before life got in the way of idealism, before kids got in the way of fearlessness, before I knew better than to take on risky assignments. Now I just write about them from my cushy little corner in suburbia. I even gave Jules Roth one of my own backstories. When I was 17 years old, I was on an internship program, program in Springfield, Illinois for a semester in high school. I was approached by a special law enforcement unit and they asked if I would be willing to be used as bait to wow. lure and help break a sex trafficking ring. Of course, I said yes. And in those days, you didn't need your parents to sign off on anything, not like now. So I, you know, in those days, there were no phones, no computers, everything was done in real time. And so this was a big moment and people were arrested. And as you can imagine, as a teenager, it was my pivotal moment that I knew I was going to have a career as a journalist, that I knew I was going to expose the tough stories and reveal the truth. I wrote Woman on Fire during COVID lockdown. I worked 10 hours a day, seven days a week, because I wanted to write a book that had everything in it that I love to read and write myself. So it's a bit of a mutt. 
It's history, art, passion, risky journalistic pursuits, and of course, strong, fiery women. Woman on Fire is a gripping tale of a savvy young journalist who gets embroiled in a major international art scandal centered around a Nazi looted masterpiece. Like all three of my novels, this book asks the question, how far would you go for your passion? Would you kill for it, steal for it, or like Jules Roth, fight for it, even if the price tag is your own life or those you love? Throughout my career, I was a full-time working journalist by day, and at night, I worked on my fiction. Now, happily, this equation is reversed. But I always say, the story that keeps you up at night is the one you have to write, must go after, no matter what. It is the one that makes you stop in your tracks. <laughs> my obsession with stolen art, Nazi looted art, began years ago. Flashback to June 1991. Now this is before Monuments Men, before the book and the movie, The Woman in Gold. I was a young journalist just out of grad school, assigned by my editor to cover an exhibit at the Art Institute of Chicago <laughs> called Degenerate Art, The Fate of the Avant-Garde in Nazi Germany. When I walked into that museum, my breath caught in my throat and chills covered my arms after viewing more than 150 paintings that the Nazis deemed degenerate, deplorable, illegal. And I knew I was not just reporting any story, I had found my story, the one that would forever change the course of my career and cleave to my soul. As a daughter of a Holocaust survivor, I began to deep dive into the world of Nazi looted art, reading <laughs> and researching anything I could get my hands on. Now, I'm a writer, not an artist, but I needed to understand what made someone both a murderous madman and an artist. Yes, Hitler, before he became Hitler, was a painter. He had been rejected twice from the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. He resorted to selling paid, painted postcards on the street and later house painting. His dream of living as an artist was never realized. I truly believe that these early rejections set the stage for what would come later. Hitler's first mission, once in power, beginning in 1933, was to destroy those artists, architects, entertainers, writers, philosophers, and teachers who did not comply with the Aryan ideal of what is art. Mm -hmm. The Nazis were determined to eradicate the avant-garde, particularly the Expressionists, a homegrown German movement of art, the free thinkers. Between 1933 and 1945, the Third Reich confiscated, destroyed, and plundered upwards of 600,000 works of art from private collections, museums, galleries, schools, and studios. It was a cultural rape and robbery on the grandest scale that began in Germany and spread like wildfire throughout Europe. Now I want you to just picture this. This is how it was. Supply stores were shut down, galleries were boarded up, paintings were burned, museums were closed, teachers and curators were stripped of their jobs, artists were subject to public ridicule and banned from exhibiting or selling their works. They were even forbidden from creating art inside the privacy of their own homes. Many artists were forced to hide or flee and numerous artists committed suicide and countless others were imprisoned and murdered. This background was the catalyst for my award-winning debut historical fiction novel, Fugitive Colors, a suspenseful tale of stolen art, love, deception, and revenge in the end of World War II. Both Fugitive Colors and Woman on Fire signify the incredible impact art had on Hitler's war. And now more than 80 years later, after most of the Holocaust survivors and Nazis have passed, this subject is still front page news. While Fugitive Colors is about the fate of the artists in Nazi Germany, Woman on Fire is about the fate of the art itself, particularly one painting, a painting by the fictitious 
leading expressionist artist, Ernst Engel, who was murdered by the Nazis in my first book, Fugitive Colors, and his last known surviving painting is Woman on Fire. That's what's called in my business, inserting an Easter egg into your novel. <clears throat> While many works of art were destroyed, those paintings like Woman on Fire deemed valuable by the Nazi regime were held hostage. Um, the Nazis took what they considered the most lucrative and sought after works for themselves and, and sold major art anonymously by creating fake histories. And with the help of Switzerland, they held secretive auctions for these major works of art. Art was currency, art was control. And this money was funneled into the Nazi war machine. But that wasn't enough. The Nazis were determined to create a facade of legitimacy by fabricating an impeccable paper trail to show that many of these stolen works were sold to the Reich willingly, and what I call the big lie. For example, in Nazi Germany, if families were forced into concentration camps, their personal records were destroyed and replaced with fake documents and forced bills of sale. Ironically, the Nazis' obsession with this so-called legitimate paper trail is now being used against them in court as evidence <coughs> of their criminal behavior by families who are desperately trying to reclaim their stolen artwork. And in fact, there were actual sales to corrupt art dealers taking advantage and profiting immensely off persecuted Jews who were, they were buying these paintings at a pittance of what the art was actually worth. And, you know, Jewish collectors took whatever they could get, even if it was next to nothing. It was wheeling and dealing at its ugliest. And ironically, this has all come full circle, you know, 80 years later. There are so many stories. But just a few weeks ago, you may have heard descendants of a Jewish couple from Germany, um, Carl and uh, Rosie Adler, who fled the Nazis in 1938, are suing the Guggenheim Foundation and demanding their Picasso, their family's Picasso back, which is worth $200 million. And they allege that the painting was sold under duress to a corrupt, corrupt art dealer um, as the couple was trying to escape the Nazis. The museum, however, which was gifted this controversial painting in 1976, refuses to surrender the masterpiece. So stay tuned, the decision is expected to be handed down by the Manhattan Supreme Court. Uh, on a positive side, we're seeing some very interesting developments. For example, in New York right now, also uh, a major Holocaust initiative was passed a few months ago. Um, and part of this initiative, every work of stolen art that a museum knows about um, has to have a plaque next to it basically saying this is a stolen uh, a painting stolen art um, we are seeing a lot of this there have been museums like the louvre that recently returned 14 major masterpieces that had been hanging on their walls for the last 50 60 years but what about the hundreds of thousands of stolen paintings worldwide that are still hidden in our revered museums and private collections. This is the background for Woman on Fire. It was inspired by the Cornelius Gurlitt art scandal known as the Munich Art Horde, which was exposed in 2013. Now this sent shockwaves through the art world, especially more than 1,500 major works of art worth approximately $1.5 billion was discovered, hid, was, was discovered hidden for nearly 50 years in the rundown, dilapidated Munich apartment of one Cornelius Gurlitt, who passed away in 2014 amid the scandal. His father was none other than Hildebrand, Hildebrand Gurlitt, one of Hitler's four authorized dealers of Nazi looted art. When, and who bequeathed, when he died in a car crash in the 70s, he bequeathed this massive treasure trove to his reclusive son, who hid the masterpieces in a food pantry and literally in the stove, layered like lasagna. We're talking the caliber of Picasso, Chagall, Cezanne, and Matisse. When I first read this expose, 
Again, I stopped in my tracks, chills rose along my arms, and I knew once again, I had my story. I thought to myself, what if my unscrupulous art dealer that I would create in Woman on Fire would rob this treasure trove? Is it a crime to rob the robber? Um, writing the wrongs of history, that's what I'm about. It's all about the fighting, seeking the truth, and not giving up. Perhaps you're seeing a pattern here. In every book I write, there is art in the background. Every book I write has a story that is a fight to the finish line. Empowered women, characters who follow their passion no matter what, twists and turns, mistakes and corrections. But in every story I write, I like to say that I leave my reader with hope. Woman on Fire is dedicated to my family and especially to my grandma, Rachel, who was my best friend and inspiration, a fighter, a Holocaust survivor who had seen the worst atrocities of mankind, having lost both parents and all her siblings in Auschwitz. But she still believed in love, believed in goodness, laughed with her whole body. Nothing could get in the way of the joy she felt about her family and her legacy. She taught me that. She will always be the voice in my head and her spirit guides my hands and the stories I choose to write. And I believe it's especially important right now in this time of surging anti-Semitism. And now I'm at it again. Um, I, am, I have a new book that's coming out. And every time I try to leave World War II, I'm pulled back in. And this one's coming out in 2024. It's called The Goddess of Warsaw. And it's about a legendary Hollywood actress, a femme fatale with a dark secret past during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So speaking of actresses and goddesses, I wanna leave you with one last story. Uh, I had decided I was going to send Woman on Fire to one celebrity. And I chose Sharon Stone for a variety of reasons, but really she was the original Woman on Fire back in my day. And I thought, why not? Let's see what happens. So I sent her a book and I thought, oh, it's gonna be trashed. And I thought nothing of it. This was November, 2021. Well, um, or October, 2021. And about a month later, I was sitting on my couch with my husband watching Netflix, <clears throat> excuse me, like everyone else. And I get a text and it was, hi, it's Sharon Stone. I'm in Europe and I'm reading your book and loving it. Has anyone optioned this? Um, <clears throat> let's just say, you could hear my screams of joy from Chicago to Pasadena. Um, six weeks later, we signed a deal and Sharon is now set to produce and star in the film adaptation of Woman on Fire. And together, our goal is to showcase the incredible journey of one powerful painting as it moves through hands, hearts, and history. So thank you so much. And as I always say, I'm an open book. And if you have questions, uh, I'd love to hear them. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. What part is Sharon Stone going to be playing in, so that's in the, the book? That's the one thing I can't talk about. I can't, I can't oh, really? talk about the details of the movie. It's just really in the beginning process but I, I can't really say too much about it. I'm sorry for that. I was just gonna Google her age to see if she's appropriate. To... She's, she's 64. She's okay, 64. then she can't play the young one. <laughs> Does uh, anyone have any questions about process or anything like that or, or the book itself? much i mean you did a, a an incredible amount of research yeah uh how long did it take you to do the research for this book well so my first book for example fugitive colors that's when i first started to really deep dive in stolen art so i went to europe i did interviews and i researched my first book for four years before I would allow pen to paper. So by the time I got to Woman on Fire, which is also, as you know, about stolen art, I had a really, really strong base for Woman on Fire. So I did a lot of research, of course, and um, I think that's kind of the blessing and the curse of being 
having been an investigative journalist my whole life as you know a lot of my friends who are a historical fiction writer they might have five sources and say this is a fact but for my training i need like 20 and once i see that then it's a fact so everything in this book that feels real is real wow that's fantastic um this woman on fire itself the painting was there a real painting by that name or a different name similar? Uh, there's, it's, it's, it was a painting inside my own head. I, I made the painting up, but um, it was very important to me that it was an expressionist work of art. As I <laughs> mentioned, uh, you know, in my talk that um, expressionism was a homegrown German movement of avant-garde movement of art. And Hitler went after the expressionist harder than he went after any of any other type of artist. And um, and so it was very important to me, and especially utilizing Ernst Engel, who was the teacher and the founder of expressionism in my first book. I, I thought it was behind me, but it's not. Um, uh, here it is. Um, this is uh, Fugitive Colors. Mm -hmm. um, he was the one who was the professor, the teacher of expressionist um, art, um, and that this was going to be his last known painting. So it needed to be a work, an expressionist work of art. So just for those who don't know, expressionism is how a painting makes you feel. So it's not the subject matter. It's not just a, you know, a bowl of fruit or um, Monet's garden in Givernay. It is wild, frenetic brushstrokes that you can't walk by an expressionist painting without having some sort of major reaction to it. <clears throat> Questions? Questions? Yep. Yeah. Um, I thought about the Klimt painting. Is it Klimt? Um, yes. And there was. Um, a, a long running trial. Did that come into your research at all? Um, so you, the woman in gold painting? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, it didn't come into my research, although I know a lot about it. Um, and uh, obviously I've read the book, I've seen the movie with Helen Marin, which is fabulous mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it. Um, but that wasn't really part of my research. Thank you. Aviva, did you have a question? Yeah, and is there, are there paintings that we can look up online or whatever that would give us some idea of what that painting that you envision in the book? Um, like? you know, it's funny you say that I have like sort of a whole express a board of work, <laughs> you know, that's in my file folder. Yeah. So you wouldn't find it anywhere. Um, but, you know, if you notice on the cover of the book, you know, they they didn't put the painting itself. It's almost sort of the end of the painting. And but they're inside of the book. There's probably um, six different descriptions of the painting. And I don't want to give anything away because someone may not have read it. But you will you know, you will really have a strong vision, your own vision of what that painting looks like. OK, I got it. Questions? Hi, Lisa. Um, I was wondering if writing this book, especially this book during the pandemic was a very different experience from writing your previous books, and if so. I, that's, that's really an excellent question. Um, it, it for sure was. I mean, I have I have three grown daughters, and but and everyone <laughs> came everyone came home. Um, so it was very interesting when I was writing this book. I'm sitting at my kitchen table. Normally, I work in a cafe pretty much five six days a week. Um, I get out of the house, get away from the laundry, my dog, everything, and I go to work at a cafe. Um, but because of COVID, I was in my house, my kids were back in the nest, and I was 
working on this 24 year old protagonist looking over my laptop <laughs> at my then 24 year old daughter. And so that was a really kind of a special experience. Also, because as you know, we were all home and pretty <clears throat> much everything stopped. Um, I was able to go full on hard working, I, you know, um, every single day on the book without any interruptions. So, for example, my first book was over a 10 year period of research, babies, life, changes, moves, everything. My second book, which is not a historical book, was uh, called The Unbreakables. It's actually very sexy women's fiction, very different from this. Um, that one I wrote pretty fast as well in about nine months. But this one, as I mentioned, which was fiction and research and history, which would normally take a lot longer. It's, it was uh, a much more, uh, it was a much faster process because of COVID. And so um, I think I just was all in without moving from my seat. And um, it really, uh, I was able to put in everything I love in this book without any distraction. Actually, that, thank you. That must have been a very different experience for your daughters. <clears throat> to, I, you know, to see me sitting and writing. Yeah, I don't think they've, I mean, they've always seen me writing. While they were doing their homework, I was writing. Before they got up from school, I was writing. After they went to bed, I was writing. You know, they have always seen me writing. Um, uh, so that part of it wasn't new. Um, but um, I mean, I think actually working with me was a new experience. So my eldest daughter and I we would take our walk around the neighborhood breaks together, which was fun. Hmm. So your daughters are pretty much used to your your lifestyle at this yeah, point. Yeah, but I but I work around them. I don't, you know, <laughs> even when I took events, you know, I have three daughters, as I mentioned, everything was balanced around my family. Uh, you know, I didn't want to miss anything with them. That was very important to me. Are any any of your daughters going into the same career? No, they're or all different careers, although my middle daughter uh, is an artist and, and in graphic design. So she's at the Art Institute of Chicago. But, oh, are, but they, nice. all have, they all have very different careers than I do. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Other other questions, ladies? I don't think we have any men. No, ladies, any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Hey, okay. well, time. thank yes. you, Lisa. And thank you lovely. very much for uh, taking out your your writing time to talk with us tonight. And I know it's cold in Chicago. Uh, hopefully staying indoors, I would presume yeah. you're doing that. And uh, we appreciate it. And thank you for being willing to reschedule from the last uh, from January. Um, uh, and yeah, thank you so much. You know what? Let me just get a screenshot of the group. If everyone could just kind of look in, I'll just collect it. If you have my book, put it up there and I, I will. Uh, that would be great. Oh, awesome. Thank you. First of all, happy International Women's Day to everyone right. here. Yes. And thank you again for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Carol. Uh -oh. Take Thank you, Lisa. Thank uh, you, Lisa. Thank you. Just bye. an announcement to the group. Uh, our Rosh Kodesh next month is going to be March. Uh, actually, we're doing a program March 22nd. It is this month uh, when we have the real <laughs> Rosh Kodesh for this month. March 22nd, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, where we will be hearing from Emily Williams, who is an oral historian and photographer about her experiences interviewing and photographing uh, Jews and their businesses and their places of worship in the South, particularly Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, she is my great niece and this is her mm -hmm. MFA project. Mm -hmm. And she's studying at Louisiana State University and that's how she spent her summer. 
and her recent winter break, she focused on interviewing uh, Jews in small towns in Louisiana and taking pictures of them. In, and her photos are all black and white with an analog camera. Hmm. So none of the new stuff for her. Um, I think you're going to enjoy it. She's already uh, done a presentation at the uh, Museum of the Jews of the South, which is in New Orleans, and it was well received. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, and then we will be having another one in April. You'll hear more about it. Watch your email. And I thank you all for coming this evening. Any other comments you want to schmooze with each other? Uh, everybody okay? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Carol, because I know you went through a great effort to make this happen. Right. And what a great speaker she was. And the book sounds so interesting. You know, and yeah, well, I want to thank Linda Mazur for bringing this book to my attention. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have another author in uh, April, I believe. So another one of uh, Linda's recommendations. Uh, and it's about a, a golem. So you should be, it's kind of a, a fantasy fiction type thing. The genie and the golem, right, Linda? So Linda knows more about it than I do. And uh I think it's going to be fun to hear from another author. Uh, it's kind of different. It's it's different than our usual Rosh Chodesh things, but um, it's people like it. So, uh, anybody have any other comments or questions or um, anything you want to say, Linda? Just to yes. let you know that takes place in the turn of the century in Lower East Side. Right. Um, we all know about the Lower East Side. So I just ordered the book. So I'm going to be reading it. Um, it's also a, there's an audio book also. If you guys, if you prefer that, um, the reader is excellent on the audio book. It's very uh, a very good reader. What's this is on the next book, you mean? Or yes. the one this one? Okay. The next Actually, um, I this book up. This one, this one is not on audio, a Woman on Fire. Uh, it's called The Hidden Palace, is our next author, and that's going to be April 19th. Uh yes. Emily Williams is March 22nd. April 19th is Helen we Helene Wecker with the W. W-E-C-K-E-R. The book is called The Hidden Palace. And there's another book called The Hidden Palace. Make sure that if you order it, you order the right one. Linda, when do you leave? Are you leaving soon? Unmute yourself. Yeah. Next, next week. Have an amazing trip. You're going yes. to, to China or? Tell Bhutan. us about your trip, Linda. B Bhutan and Nepal. Into oh, and Nepal, even crazier. Wow. Have a great trip. Be careful, be safe. <laughs> Thank you. We'll miss you. Is it, oh, happy is is it cold there this time of year? Up, so. Is it cold there? No, I think it depending on how high you are and how low I you see. are. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to climb the mountain while you're there? Yeah, we'll we'll at least get to no, I'm kidding. Um <laughs> but we are doing a lot. We are doing five miles a day, several days. Not wow. not up to a lodge, up to a lodge, up to a lodge, but we're based in one lodge and then we go out and to these villages which are a couple miles away and then have to come back. And don't forget everything is is steep. It's steep, it's not flat. Be careful, Linda. You don't want to fall. We're getting in shape. We're getting, yeah. We're in, enjoying our Angeles National Forest. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, good night, everybody. I have good night, to night, Diane. Bye, Bye everyone. Good Enjoy. night. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>